I am honored to be able to speak here today, sharing the platform with two distinguished speakers. Their work are important contributions to our understanding of how nature and social spaces can be extended into the sky. I believe that green social spaces in the air can make much needed social improvements in high rise houses. Indeed, they should become more commonplace. But of course, sky bridges, terraces, or courts are expenses that have to be paid for. Moreover, sky courts also take up space that could otherwise be used to fit in more apartments and so represent an opportunity cost. But I believe that we can actually design sky courts in a way that makes it affordable for more people. I have an idea for a layout concept where the extra cost for the sky courts can be balanced by eliminating corridors. And my aim is to try to convince you of that idea. But first, a little bit about where I'm coming from. When I was a student in the 1970s, experts were lining up to condemn high-rise housing. This was a time when the infamous Fried Igo high-rise apartments were being demolished. Study after study have shown that living in high-rise housing is less suited for people compared to low-rise. A 2007 review of 129 high-rise research papers over 56 years on the human experience of tall buildings found very little evidence to support high-rise housing, particularly when it comes to children. One suggestion is that the defects of high-rise housing spring mainly from the quality of spaces between the street and the apartment, so-called intermediate spaces, which is lamented as weird anonymous space, neither public nor private. Indeed, high-rise housing makes necessary the provision of access from the building entrance at street level to the front door of every apartment on the upper levels of the building. Not only lifts and staircases, but also lobbies and corridors. The problem is that these spaces are neither suited for children to play in or for adults to socialize. A recent CTBUH article suggests that articulating the threshold between the public and private domains by introducing the missing element of the semi-private realm has long been a challenge. Failure to do so is a major drawback of the high-rise residential typology. Low-rise housing can have spaces just outside the home, front yards and streets that encourages social interaction. High-rise housing do not have them. Architect researcher Oscar Newman said about the same thing 40 years ago. Newman had observed that across the street from apartments that were eventually demolished at Brit Rigo was an older low-rise rehousing complex occupied by people from the same background which remained fully occupied and trouble-free throughout the decline of the high-rise. Newman's theory was that it was the quality of the spaces just outside the low-rise homes compared with those outside the high-rise that made the difference. He recommended that architects design in semi-private and semi-public spaces in between the dwellings and the street. His influence over my work over the last 10 years is pretty obvious. I've tried to create, through the arrangement of a private and a shared garden for each house, what Oscar Newman called defensible space, trying to humanize intermediate space and articulating the threshold between public and private domains, albeit for low rise. In what I call honeycomb housing, small groups of houses are laid out around a communal courtyard like friends sitting around a table. The features of honeycomb housing compared to conventional terrace houses make it easier for parents to allow their children to play outside their homes, encourage neighbors to know and interact with each other, and perhaps even promote healthy behavior. Compared to conventional terrace house grid layout, the honeycomb cul-de-sac layout reduced the amount of land taken up by roads and increased the area available for private and shared gardens. This cost-saving feature has certainly helped to put the honeycomb idea into practice. Can we now do something similar for high-rise apartments? In this new high-rise idea, I call it the sky neighborhood concept, Every resident can step out of her main door to her front yard and beyond that a landscape courtyard or sky court with a garden fence at the edge. The doors lining the courtyard are the front doors to the apartments. All apartments in this neighborhood in the sky 
will have such doors leading into a lofty six-story high sky court which contains private and shared gardens. I'm sure you're wondering, how do the floors above the courtyard level, and there are five of them, get their access to their own six-story sky court? Will the cost of providing this lavish-looking green courtyard in the sky be exorbitant? Let's begin with the first question. How is it done? This slide explains the problem to be solved. These are two sky courts on the same floor. To be six stories high, they have to be flanked by six stories of apartments. There has to be a central lobby with lifts and a firefighting staircase and escape staircases. How indeed can each one of the six stories of apartments get direct access to a sky court? Let's look at a portion of this plan to a basic module. The basic module in this layout comprises two double-story apartments which occupy three floors, one placed on the top of each other, such that access to both apartment units are on the courtyard level, with one unit connected to another floor above the courtyard level, and the other apartment joined to the floor below the courtyard level. This is looking at the pair of apartments from the front. As you can see, the pair of two-storey apartments take up three floors, but both can be accessed from the courtyard level. This is the same pair of apartments, but looking at them from the side. Stacking two pairs of these interlocking apartments on top of each other produces a three-storey high sky court. However, stacking these apartments on top of each other such that the courtyards split from one side to the opposite side produces a six-storey high sky court. This slide shows how each floor in the six-storey high sky court can open out onto its own shared and private gardens. The first floor above the courtyard level is part of a unit which is on the same level as the courtyard. The second and fourth floors are both linked to the third floor where there is another courtyard which is hidden from view. The fifth floor is linked to the courtyard one floor above it. In Equatorial Malaysia, the blocks are best aligned north, south, east and west, such that all the four sky courts should get some sunlight. This design thus allows in plenty of light and ventilation but provides cover from direct rainfall. Each and every resident in this new type of apartment can be afforded with a shared and private garden. So the features of the low-rise honeycomb housing have now been replicated for high-rise. Before we go on to the cost aspect, I'd like to dwell on why we would want to have such an arrangement in the first place. Each and every resident in this new type of apartment can have a shared and a private garden. There is sufficient space and light to allow trees to be planted just outside your high-rise home. As a resident, you share a communal courtyard with a small number of households, making it easy for neighbours to get to know and interact with each other. The private gardens serve as a buffer between the communal sky court garden and the apartment front doors and windows, an arrangement that mimics the front yards of low-rise homes. With many eyes overlooking the sky court, along with safety measures such as a garden fence at the edge of the sky court and child barriers at strategic locations, the sky court can be made safe for children so that high-rise can be suitable for families. So on to question two. Will the cost of this new type of apartment be exorbitant, making it suitable only for the high-end market? To answer this question, we designed a 30-story prototype so that it can be compared with other types of apartments and help explain how the new concept provides for circulation more efficiently. In this design prototype, apartments face landscape six-storey high sky courts. 274 apartment units are served by 16 sky courts, each sky courtyard typically consisting of 18 apartments. On the ground floor of the podium block are the entrance lobby, shops and the service and utility rooms. On the first to third floors are car parks. On the podium are 18 apartments, community and prayer halls and a bigger green area. The apartments, mainly duplex units, are arranged in an X form with pairs of courtyards that swing from one side to the other on every three floors. 
These are the floor plans of the apartments facing east and west. And these are the floor plans for the apartments facing north and south. Space usage was divided into five categories. Apartment interior, apartment external area, the shared sky court area, circulation space and services. The establishment is that of a typical courtyard and the three stories of apartments that are accessed from it. It shows that with the Sky neighborhood, the circulation space is only 4.32% of the total area served by it. The percentage of circulation space plus services added in is only 5.1%. This is a remarkably low figure. To appreciate this fact, let's now compare it with some examples of high-rise apartments with conventional and less conventional layouts. We can categorize existing high-rise apartment layouts by the method of access to each apartment. Single or double loading corridors for slab blocks and central lobbies for tower blocks and so on. We selected examples of the common and not so common topologies, analyzed their usage of space in the same way that we did for the Sky Neighborhood example and tabulated the results. This plan shows the apartment block at Woodlands Drive 41 in Singapore with a single loading corridor. This arrangement is not very efficient. Circulation here takes up a considerable 18.8% .8 of the total floor area. Apartments with central loading corridor is more efficient, serving apartments on two rows along it. However, compared with a single loading corridor, ventilation and light is not so good. This is a view of Furi Apartments in Puchong Selangor with a double loading corridor. Here, circulation makes up 16.03% of the total floor area. This is the Blues Point Tower in Sydney. In the tower block, apartments are positioned around the central lift lobby. In this setup, there's not much corridor space, but on the other hand, the number of units that can be served by the single lift lobby is limited. Here, the efficient arrangement of circulation space is offset by the rather inefficient sharing of lifts by a small number of housing units. In the style block, circulation takes up 11.9% of the floor area. The lifts only serve seven units on this floor. The Caesars Corridor was introduced by Le Corbusier in Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. Here, internal double loading corridors serve two rows of duplexes positioned opposite each other in an interlocking arrangement. These corridors are only required to serve every three floors. The percentage of floor space taken up by the central corridor is very low at only 8.13% for the three floors served by the corridor. The skip stop lifts need only stop on one floor and skip the other two. That one stop serves 58 units. This is an extremely efficient layout and is not more common perhaps because of the corridor in this type of layout is so long and narrow and has no windows. The apartment units as well are long and narrow. Still, it's a clever layout that efficiently deploys circulation space and lifts. In the 1970s, Ellison and Peter Smithson developed an improvement on the Caesars corridor layout concept by having a single loading external corridor. Here, the quality of the excess corridor is much improved. The wide, vent well ventilated excess external corridors were promoted as streets in the air. Here, the circulation space was not as efficient as Unité d'Habitation but was still good at 12.58%. This table shows the five examples of conventional layout plans and compares them with the Sky Neighborhood design where the circulation spaces, including any corridors and services, occupy less than 5.1%. In contrast, the circulation space for conventional apartments range from 8.13% to 18.8%. Indeed, circulation space in the Sky Neighborhood design is minimized to less than any existing type of apartment. The sellable apartment space, inclusive of the respective private courtyards, is about 86.5% of the available space. This compares with the sellable apartment area making up about 81 to 88% of the total area in the conventional apartments and 92% for unité d'habitation. Even after adding in the communal courtyard space to circulation space, the total for it at 13.5% is lower than the circulation space in the majority of conventional apartments. This very substantial efficiency improvement is all the more remarkable because it is achieved by making the apartment design more attractive, not less, by extending the benefits of having a landscape sky court 
to every apartment. Indeed, the introduction of sky squads is the key. However, the comparisons done in this study only took account of the typical floor plans. They did not take into account the area breakdown of the whole tower block. As such, any amenities for social use found on the ground floors or on intermediate floors of the blocks were not taken into account. In our new study, published in the proceedings of this conference, we compared the Sky Neighbourhood layout with a selection of apartment layouts that have been adopted for public housing in Singapore. The area breakdown for each apartment block is calculated starting from the ground up to the top floor. Back in the 1960s, Singapore's leaders took note of all the bad press against high-rise housing but then carried on building them nevertheless. The government, through their Housing Development Board, embarked on a mission to house the nation with large-scale public housing development. By 1976, more than 50% of the population was living in HDB flats. Now, over 80% of Singapore residents live in public high-rise housing. Satisfaction surveys now show that residents of HDB flats are happy with their situation. So looking for a benchmark for socially responsible high-rise design, they look to Singapore. A survey of the various apartment layouts adopted for public housing in Singapore was done. We decided to choose apartments with at least one of the following layout features. Slab blocks with single loading corridor without a void deck. Single loading corridors with ground floor void decks and skip stop lifts. Tower blocks with ground floor void decks and central lobbies. Cluster blocks with ground floor void decks. Blocks which have ground floor decks and sky terraces in the upper floors. This table shows the seven Singapore examples and compares them with the sky neighbourhood design. The circulation space for conventional apartments range from 8.7% to 20.4%, but circulation space in the sky neighbourhood designs is minimised to only 4.8%. Among the seven comparators, the amenities area range from 0 to 7.5%, compared to 11.05% for the Sky neighbourhood. The sellable apartment space inclusive of the respective private courtyards for the new prototype is about 84.1%, which compares with the sellable apartment area making up about 71.6% to 87.2% of the total area for the comparators. Among the Singapore examples, the most efficient layout is 710 Ang Mo Kio Avenue 8. The internal apartment area made up of 83% of the total build-up area. Together with the private balconies, the sellable area came up to 87.3%. The amount of circulation is also especially low at 8.7%. This is a very leanly designed tower block where the four apartments on each floor have doors opening directly into a central lift lobby. On top of this, the whole block is serviced by only a single escape staircase. Still, the Sky neighbourhood layout produced circulation space that is very low. At 4.8%, it is almost half of the tower block example. The Sky neighbourhood model also has a very high percentage of amenities area. At 11.05%, this is 50% more than the Singapore example with the most generous provision of amenity space which is Ang Mo Kyo Avenue 3, the 11 storey flat block with a large ground floor void deck at 7.5%. In terms of internal apartment floor area, the Sky neighbourhood layout at 78% has about the same efficiency as the fourth most efficient Singapore example, Ang Mo Kyo Avenue 3 at 77.9%. However, when the external area is added on to the internal floor area to get the total saleable area, the Sky Neighbourhood layout at 84.1% is about the same efficiency as the second best Singapore example, Bermuda Courts at 84.4%. So, this new study corroborates with the earlier one. By replacing corridors with Sky Courts, cost savings can be made while at the same time improving the social quality of high-rise. In the early Singapore examples, the skip-stop lifts were adopted to save costs. The savings on the cost of the lift doors plays the smaller part. 
The main savings come from having lifts that travel faster between stops, reducing waiting time or else the number of lifts that are needed. The lifts in this Sky neighborhood model only need to stop every three floors at the courtyard levels, but residents don't need to go up or down from the floors with lift stops to go to their own apartment like the Singapore examples. From the entrance level of each apartment, residents walk straight to their homes. They only walk one floor up or one floor down to get to their bedrooms. We used an online calculator provided by Kony on the design prototype. When we entered lift stops at every one of the 27 residential floors, the calculator estimated that three lifts were needed. However, when we entered the actual lift stops required, which is nine stops, the calculator estimated that only two lifts were needed. I believe that the Sky Neighborhoods apartment topology can be a new approach that goes to the heart of the problem with high-rise, to solve the problem of circulation and intermediate spaces in high-rise apartments. Corridors are replaced with spacious sky courts, and by the way, it also gets the lifts to work more efficiently. Yes, extra costs will certainly be occurred to construct and landscape the six-story high sky courts. However, savings arising from totally eliminating corridors and reducing lift stops can claw back much of the extra cost. Then there is the cost of land, which in city centre development can far exceed the cost of construction. Our 30 storey building on a small site of 0 0.6 hectares yields a plot ratio of 4.9 and a density of 358 units per hectare, which is 40% higher than the current planning standard in Malaysia. If planning authorities can accept the argument that high-rise housing can be socially acceptable, then they might be persuaded to approve this higher density. The very reason for high-rise housing is the exorbitant cost of land in urban centres. Permission to build to a higher plot ratio would contribute to savings on land costs. In situations where the construction cost is equal to the cost of land, a 40% increase in net plot ratio is equivalent to a 40% decrease in the construction cost of sellable net built-up area. If, as we stack more apartments on top of each other to go higher up, we also add more gardens and parks, creating villages in the sky, then the social problems of high-rise can be overcome. Being able to double or triple livable space from the scarce and expensive urban land would help make it more affordable for housing. Eliminating corridors and to instead create village greens just outside every apartment offers the prospect of improving both the quality and affordability of high-rise housing.